Father, on this day, as we gather in your presence, called here and invited by your Holy Spirit, saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, we give you praise and honor as our Father in heaven. And pray, Father, that because we are in your presence, because we are coming to your word, that your Holy Spirit would work the character of your Son, Jesus Christ, in us, that we would become more like you, become more of an honor to you, and through this act of worship, there would be much fruit in the kingdom of God because of your love for us. This we ask in and through the name of Christ Jesus our Lord and the sons and daughters of God said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I remember the day like it was yesterday. Honestly, I couldn't have been more than seven or eight years old, but I can still see the scene in my mind's eye. Like I see you, uh, seven or eight years old, I, I stopped on the front porch of our house. I, I think we were returning home, maybe, I, I don't know where we were going, but I stopped on the front porch of my grandparents' house. I looked in my grandfather's eyes and said these words. Grandpa, I've never had a $10 bill before. Now, understand, this is some 45 years later that I remember this story. And back then, I did not understand the power of a grandchild's request to their grandparents. Now I do. You all know by now across the country, literally across the country, there's a two-year-old little redhead about this tall who's developing all of her personality, just a little over three months old, who's starting to smile and do all those things babies do, that this pop-up wouldn't do anything they asked me to do. I would move heaven and earth if they asked me to. I, I didn't understand that all those years ago, but this is what I know. I looked my grandfather in the eye and said, Grandpa, I've never had a $10 bill before. You've got to know that quickly. I had a $10 bill in my hot little hand and it, it went into my pocket. To this day, I can't remember what I bought with that $10 bill. But I remember my grandfather had a $10 bill quicker than I knew what to do with. That was the nature of the relationship I had with my grandfather. You may or you may not know that I carry his name, Arthur Thomas Roxby III. Unfortunately, on this Father's Day, I'm Arthur Thomas Roxby the last, because one and two have gone home to be with Jesus. Uh, in fact, I not only carried his full official name, I carried his nickname as well. Other than my daughter, does anybody else know my given nickname? They in the back do. I, I've shared it with you before, but if you promise not to tell anybody, okay, if you promise not to tell anybody, I'll tell you, but if you tell somebody, I might have to kill you. My given nickname in my childhood days was Butch which was the very same nickname my grandfather had in the Hardcore region up in Pennsylvania where he was born and raised. He was everything to me. We went so many places together. There's a picture of me, and I don't know where the picture is. I need to go home and go through boxes and boxes of those pictures. There's a picture I can, and by the way, that's him on the screen behind me. There's a picture that I remember of me in my grandfather's arms in the Tasty Freeze on Route 22 and Phil 322 in Phillipsburg. And I, I've got to be two, maybe three. But in my hands is a vanilla ice cream cone. And I'm doing what two or three year old little boys try to do with vanilla ice cream cones. I'm trying to push that whole ice cream cone into my face. Back to my ears and around my hair. And, and I'm there in my grandfather's arms. My grandfather built me and gave me my first race car. Now, you got to understand, you got to fast forward to 1969, 70, 71, somewhere in there. You know, I was a fan of racing back then, and 
It wasn't like today. Kids today, they race these go-karts that are thousands of dollars. I got my first race car from my grandfather. I drove that thing all over the place, racing whomever I could race. Well, I, I probably need to share with you what my race car was. It was fabricated by my grandfather, and it began with, well, an oak cable spool. Have you seen these big, people turn them into tables now? It, it started with that, sat on the back porch. Then on top of that cable spool sat our booster seat for the dining room table, and through the hole in the cable spool was stuck a steering wheel and shaft out of a wrecked 1951 Mercury Coupe that was rusting away on the farm. My grandfather built me that, and I won race after race after race, probably against Richard Petty in those days. He got his farm all tractor. I, I, I forget which model it was, but you know, there's pictures of me sitting on his lap driving that tractor and you know, doing whatever we But he decided I had to have one too. So he brought home from the Western Auto, back when Western Autos were a thing, a small scale pedal model of a farm all tractor that I pedaled all over the driveway. I wish I had it. It's, it's worth some serious money today. I don't, it's long gone. My first hunting vest was a hand-me-down vest from my grandfather. He took me hunting. He taught me how to hunt. I used to watch him hand load shotgun shells and rifle shells by the hour. I was fascinated with the process. He taught me how to play baseball. Back in his younger days, he was a pitcher of some fame. Uh, was actually quite good. He, he started organized ball in the Army when he was stationed in Panama, the Canal Zone during World War II, and later on in the Galapagos Islands where he was a quartermaster. And he came home and joined the South Phillipsburg baseball team who went all over central Pennsylvania playing ball. And he would pitch and was quite good. In fact, so good, I only found out after he died that sometime in maybe 1946 or 1947, a scout from the Pittsburgh Pirates came and offered my grandfather a contract to join the Pittsburgh Pirates baseball organization. To which he said, no, I've been away from home for four years in the war. It is time for me now to quit playing games. Now think about this a minute. To quit playing games and take care of my family. Can you imagine someone today with a contract from a professional sports franchise in today's value saying, no, it, it's time for me to take care of my family. But he did. And it occurred to me as we were preparing for Grandpa's funeral that had he signed that contract, in all likelihood, he would have been a member of the 1960 Pittsburgh Pirates that won the World Series title against the vaunted 1960 Yankees. He taught me how to pitch, and I can remember in the backyard him throwing and showing me how to throw a curveball and talking to me for hours about how to hit and the baseball players. And we watch ball games together. In fact, a cherished memory I have is of all of us as a family going to the Altoona Curve baseball game, minor league affiliate of the Pirates, on what was Arthur Roxby Senior Night. He was recognized on the board. My uncle bought him a jersey and a hat, and he couldn't see the field, but he was at the ball field. In my gun cabinet, I have a couple of custom rifles that he built, and his prize Browning shotgun time he gave me, the conversations that we had, the jokes that we shared, the skills that he taught me have contributed to who I am and form my life even yet today. You see, he was one of my first mentors. Mentoring is a part of our God-given mission as followers of Jesus Christ. It is a part of our DNA. It is a part of who we should be. You think as you read Scripture, and, and sometimes I, I want to encourage you to do this, go through Scripture and just look at the number of mentoring relationships you find in the Bible. Stop and think for a moment about Moses and two young men named Caleb and Joshua. They spent all of those time together 
40 years to be exact. And who was it that succeeded Moses as the leader of the nation of Israel? It was Joshua and Caleb. Uh, they learned how to be men, how to be men of God by following and sharing a journey with Moses. Elijah came alongside this farmer by the name of Elisha. And guess what Elijah did? He mentored Elisha, and Elisha followed him around. We call them disciples, but what is discipleship anyhow if it's not mentoring? And along the way, Elisha succeeded Elijah when he was carried up in a whirlwind to become an even greater prophet of God in the mode of Elijah. Think about a man by the name of Jesus mentoring 12 rough as a cob backwood fishermen from the shores of the Sea of Galilee. What did they do for three years? They went places. They took a road trip. They walked. They talked. They joked. They listened to Jesus teach. They saw how Jesus acted and reacted when he was very nearly stoned in his hometown. And guess what Jesus did? He entrusted his mission and his message to those twelve. Thanks be to God, because we sit in this place this morning, recipients of the mentoring that Jesus gave to twelve. Oh, and by the way, another one of my heroes by the name of Paul. Stop for a minute. Eleanor read 2 Timothy that is the base for the scripture this morning, but I want you to back up to the book of Acts. Paul, before he was Paul, was Saul. Saul, the Pharisee of Pharisees, whose profession it was to go about Israel and persecute followers of Jesus Christ, to literally kill these ones who stood in the way. Let's not forget, Saul was the one who stood at the stoning of, of Stephen, held their coats, and by the way, cheered them on as they threw their stones down and snuffed out the life of one of the first leaders of the church. That was Saul. But on his journey to Damascus, to do more of the same, Saul had an encounter with the risen Christ. He saw on that road the glory of Jesus Christ, risen from the dead with the stamp of God's approval on his mission and message, and said yes to Jesus Christ, was struck blind by the glory of God, and went on into Damascus. Now put yourself in the shoes of the Christians in Damascus. Here is Saul, the Pharisee of Pharisees, literally with an order in his pocket to do whatever he had to do to snuff out the lives of Christians and stop in this way. What are you going to do when he comes to your town blind? That's not what Ananias of Damascus did. Do you know that name, Ananias of Damascus? If you don't, you should, because he is part of the reason why we're here today. Ananias of Damascus, not to be confused with Ananias and Ananias of Sapphira fame in Acts chapter 5, Ananias of Damascus meets this fallen Pharisee named Saul and walks alongside him. And for 40 days, while Paul resides in Damascus, before he becomes Paul, Ananias mentors Saul becoming Paul. And in fact, takes Paul back to Jerusalem and introduces him, gives him a certificate of introduction to the disciples in the church who knew Saul because of the stoning of Stephen. How different might our history as followers of Jesus Christ be had it not been for Ananias of Damascus? How different? Oh, and, and let's not forget, Paul becomes a mentor as well. Think about the who's who of people mentored by Paul. Silas, Barnabas, John Mark, Timothy. And many others all become heritage to the investment of Paul in those who came along behind them. Paul becomes the great missionary of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He 
you know, of course, today is the first Father's Day that I've had since my dad's passing. This message has been living in me literally for over a week as I've thought about this day. Last October 6th, he went home to be with Jesus. My dad was one of my lifelong mentors. We worked together. Now, please understand, as, as a teenager, I did not always appreciate the work we did together. Uh, Dad made me work as a team. He gave sacrificially of my time. Maybe I need to say that one. He gave sacrificially of my time. Uh, since I was nine years old, I lived in a parsonage of the Church of the Nazarene. And I remember very early on being there for every work day. When I would have rather been playing, I was there for every work day. I remember as he built the parsonage for the Freedom Church of the Nazarene, being there to dig ditches, to help. I didn't lay blocks. I wasn't that qualified. I was only 10 or 11 years old, 12 maybe. I would carry blocks. Not the little 8-inch ones, the big 10-inch ones. And we'd line them up while Dad was laying them. And I remember helping to mix concrete and rake and seed and carry lumber and pull wire. And, and then we only lived about 30 miles away from the Pittsburgh district camp. And the district found out my dad was a contractor before he went into the ministry. So we spent our summers at the camp. I can remember seeing my dad in a bosun's chair helping to erect a tent for camp meeting. I remember when the electric in the, the uh, campground units got to be bad. Dad and, and two other pastors rewired all of the campsites. Well, guess who got to be there for all the dirty work? I could take you to that camp today. In fact, the day Dad died, I was on the campground. I performed the wedding of my niece. And as I looked over my niece's shoulder, I could see the tabernacle. Betsy, you know it well at the Pittsburgh District Camp. I was in that camp, uh, in that tabernacle, the night a, a huge August thunderstorm came and shredded it. So the next year they built a brand new solid tabernacle, which meant I spent many weekends there. But I learned a skill that I would use with my dad the rest of my life. He taught me how to do siding. And the particular uh, project that I remember was this thing had, had a, a tall front between uh, the, the, um, the fascia and the roof line that we put siding in. So we would cut siding panels and put them in, and while we were putting the fascia in, I would put soffit pans in. And there were three crews doing that on the sides of this great tabernacle that's probably, Lord, I don't know, 150 or 200 feet across in a circle. So Dad and I were one crew. And there were two other crews that were three or four men each, and Dad very quickly said, here's what I want you to do. You, you put the J-channel up, you call me a measurement out for it to start and one to end, and I'll cut and you install. So Dad and I, for three days, cut and installed soffit and fascia. Now, by the end of that three days, Dad and I, by ourselves, had installed one or two sections more than half of the soft and fascia in that tabernacle than did the other two crews combined. And th that kind of became a theme for Dad and I in our life. Uh, if you would go today, has anybody here been to the Petersburg Church of the Nazarene in Petersburg, Pennsylvania? Uh, Ray and Abby have. Dad built the fellowship hall on that. Guess who got to nail siding on more than half of that building? Dad and I. That's Mary, I told you. And we did that throughout his ministry. He'd, he'd get some side work sometimes. And we'd go and do siding or do some work inside. And, you know, I came to really enjoy that. Because while we were working, we would talk. We would laugh. We would tell stories. We'd talk about so many things. Dad would cut and I would call measurements. And in between, we'd tell jokes. The... the, the, the Topics of the day were as far-ranging as the news of the day. Sometimes we talk about hunting, especially if we were planning on taking a hunting trip. Oh, by the way, how cool is it? This October 6th, the 
first anniversary of his passing, I'm going to be in Colorado with my brother and son hunting with a friend of mine. And I can't think of a better way to spend that day. Uh, but we talk about hunting, about fishing. He loved to fish. Towards the end of his life, he just wanted to come to Delaware and take one more trip out in the bay on the Thelma Dale, and he couldn't get on that boat. But we'd also talk about ministry, uh, about our churches that we each pastored when we pastored on the same district. When we talk about the joys of pastoral ministry, we talk about the pains of pastoral ministry. Sometimes we even gave them names. That was a joke. And he taught me how to fish. Dad was a great fisherman. He absolutely was. I watched him more than once fish people off. He'd do this thing. And if, if you were the guy that was fishing, it would be maddening. He'd walk up to a stream, and he would know it pretty well, and he'd want to fish somewhere. And if, if somebody was there, he would sit down by the stream and just kind of wait. And the guy's like, oh, I'll be done in a few minutes. Dad's like, no, take your time. I'm not worried. Just... And the guy would move downstream, and then Dad would step down into the stream. He'd put a salmon egg on his hook, and maybe this guy had caught fish. Most of the time he hadn't. He'd flip that egg upstream, and boom, he'd catch a fish. And he'd catch a fish. And he'd catch a fish. And more than once, I watched as these guys would beat downstream. They'd look at my dad. Sometimes they would say words I can't repeat in public. But more often than not, they would shake their head, reel their line up, and leave. I saw that happen over and over and over again. And I, I need to tell you, this, this it's not in my notes. It's a freebie this morning. That genetic is passed on to at least two of my children. I'll tell a story on Abby. I, I remember not too long ago, it was uh, just a few years before this picture was taken, we were in Potter County, Pennsylvania fishing, and Pat, Pat helped teach Abby how to fish. And We're at the stream, one of our favorite places to fish, and Abby was getting to that place where I knew I didn't have to sit right there beside her and watch. She was getting to be a pretty good fisherman. And she was catching a few fish, so I went across the stream where I could, you know, keep a dad eye on her, but you know, let her do her thing. And the next thing I know, there's two young men, I don't know, 22, 23 years old, who have literally bracketed her in the stream. And they're fishing right where she was. Now, they had been in the center of the stream on the bridge, but saw her catching fish, and they came over and bracketed her. Now... In the spirit of transparency, I need to tell you, my temper began to rile. Because what kind of a man does it take to, to crowd a 10-year-old girl? My inclination was to go over and put my boot in their backside and kick them into the stream. The Lord had better plans. I went over, and in no uncertain terms, I said, Abby, you come with me. And she reeled in, and these guys started to step right into where she was. I said, we're going to go across the stream. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand on that side of the stream, and I want you to catch a fish. And every time you catch a fish, I want you to hold it up and say, Oh, look, Daddy! Take it off the hook and throw it back in the stream. That happened about three or four times. And I was like, Oh, that's a great job, Abby. And the next thing I know, there's two young men who probably said some words I can't repeat in public, shook their heads and walked away. And I told Abby that day, I said, Pat, Pat, would be proud of you fish guys off stream. Mm. At face value, it was a pretty cool day for a moment, the day I outfished my dad. I thought, I've arrived. Until the moment I turned and looked at him riding his power chair up the hill and realized his fishing rod, the one that I now use, is laying over in the brush and the Parkinson's had taken his motor skills away. It's, it took 70 plus years and Parkinson's and mini strokes for me to fish my dad. He taught me how to fish, he taught me how to hunt. Some of the favorite memories I have are of trips we took 20, 24 hours in a vehicle talking the whole way. And my dad taught me how to preach. Now, one of the things you probably don't know yet, 
the last weekend, the last time I ever saw my dad was the weekend last fall before I spoke at Freedom Trails Men's Retreat. And I got a scare. We had our fall revival the week before that. Literally the night before that revival, my mom called and said, Art, your dad's in a bad way. I don't know how long he's going to be around. Literally, Chick Shaver was coming in the next day and said, what am I going to do? Well, and I, I made arrangements with Chick that if things got worse, that because Chick was staying with us, it's like, well, we'll just take it. The next morning, I got a call and said, he woke up, he's fine this morning. Clear as a bell, had breakfast, hassling the help, do your revival, do what you need to do. So we did, and you know that. Well, I cleared my schedule ahead of that retreat. It wasn't too far from where my folks lived, and I, I went home. The morning Chick left here, I, I drove to Mom and Dad's. And he was in great shape. We had, I had Thursday and part of Friday to visit with Dad before I went to that retreat. He was as clear as a bell. And we talked about everything. But as I got ready to, to go to that retreat, Dad looked at me and he said, I would give anything to preach one more sermon. He said, I want to come to your church. And I, I've been writing a sermon. Now, if you know anything about Parkinson's, one of the things it takes is your voice. And it started, it not, hadn't started yet, it robbed Dad of his voice. But that day, clear as a bell, he began to share this too bad, the writing was too small. But he was writing this sermon in his head. And just before I went to speak to 15 men for the weekend, my dad preached that sermon to me. One last sermon he longed to preach. He wanted to preach one more time. Now, I, I've been talking to you about mentors who are my spiritual fathers, and there are so many more. I can tell you about Herbert I. Livingston. I'd love to t take the time to tell you, but I won't. Uh, but suffice it to say this, he was that retired pastor in one of my dad's churches, black suit, white shirt, plain tie, bought my dad when he went to Boswell a black suit and a white shirt and a plain tie so he would have proper clothes to preach in. And when he prayed as a 16 or a 17 year old young man, probably sitting about where Tom was sitting in that sanctuary in Boswell, when Brother Herb Livingston prayed, heaven was open. And he came to me New Year's morning, 1984, hours before I left to go to Trevecca Nazarene College. He grabbed me by the arm, and I, I don't know how old Brother Livingston was. He was somewhere between 85 and 160. Snow white hair. Grabbed me by the arm, and in that gravelly voice, he looked at me and said, Young man, if you go to that college, and you go to that cemetery, Nazarene Seminary, and get so educated, you are no earthly good, I am going to come and kick you in your behind. i got to tell you, to this day, that still makes me laugh, because he was 150 years old, to my knowledge. But I always remembered that. As I was going through... Going through the history of the Riot Church of the Nazarene when I went to pastor there, I discovered the history of the church began when the pastor of the St. Clairsville Church of the Nazarene in St. Clairsville, Pennsylvania, just over the ridge, began to get a burden for the community of riot at the mouth of Dunkard Hollow. And the pastor had a vision that there would be a holiness church in Dunkard Hollow, and they began to hold tent meetings there. And the Riot Church of the Nazarene was birthed out of that pastor's vision, and he was its first pastor. That pastor's name was Herbert I. Livingston. And I pastored the church he planted. And then I, just a few weeks, we're going to be going to Roxbury Camp. When Pastor Livingston retired from the Church of the Nazarene, he joined the Brethren in Christ, and their annual conference was at Roxbury Camp. There was he was there teaching me how to pray, getting a burden for holiness of heart and life. I, I could tell you about Pete Charler, uh, my dad's best friend, 
who was always there to encourage me, always there to challenge me in my walk with God. Whenever I was down, I would talk to Pete. And there's some books of Pete's in my library today. Of Dr. Hal Cothran, after whose beard I model my own. His was much longer than mine. He was my New Testament professor in college, but taught me what it means to care about a person, not just a grade or not just a performance. He taught me to love the New Testament and love Greek. Dr. Al Truesdale, a man who the first time I met him intimidated the life out of me, but taught me, Gene knows, he was my professor first for philosophy, First class in seminary. The first paper I ever failed came from Al Truesdale. But he taught me how to embrace scholarship. And, and there is no divide between a heart lived for Jesus Christ and an inquiring mind who's given to excellence in learning. I saw Al, 80 something years old at the M19 conference, still writing. These men, and so many, many more have poured themselves into my life. They've formed my soul. They have literally created the man that I am today, created the pastor that I am today, created the scholar, the teacher, and the disciple that I am today. I thank God for mentors in my journey. And I thank God for Paul. This passage that you read this morning uh, was read for you, and hopefully you know something about the book of 2 Timothy. Paul is writing from prison. 2 Timothy is literally one of the last books that Paul wrote before he was executed in Rome. And he's writing to Timothy, who was his young protege, and he's encouraging him in his walk. He's giving insights throughout these letters, by the way. We have insights into the nature of the relationship between Paul and Timothy. Paul has this awareness that his time on life is not long. And in fact, if you read ahead in uh, chapter 4, and you find Paul saying, I have fought the fight, I have run the race. The time for my reward is now at hand. And he's taking the time before that to write to Timothy, to encourage him in his walk. Timothy's not there. Paul's encouraging him to come Quickly, Timothy, because you encourage me. And many times across these two letters that bear Timothy's name, we see Paul affirming his love for Timothy, his affection for Timothy. And in this passage, he is challenging Timothy. And let me just give you a quick synopsis of what Paul's saying. He said, Timothy, here's the deal. We have walked together. We have journeyed together. You have seen what's happened in my life. You have seen me through shipwrecks. You have seen me through conflicts. You have seen what happens when Satan would uh, oppress me and oppress the work of God. You have been witness to these things, and you have seen the power of God to overcome. You've heard the teaching. You know sound theology. By the way, Romans is already in existence at this point. Timothy probably would have been nearby to Paul when either he wrote it or it transcribed it or as it's circulating in Rome. Paul, uh, Timothy knows Paul's thinking. Why? Did Paul sit down and write a theology and said, Here, Timothy, this is what I believe. No. Timothy lived with Paul. They walked together. They talked together. Timothy heard, and, and by the way, what happens when you take a trip? Yesterday, Mary and Vanjie and I drove over to Denton to the NMI thing we had yesterday. Do you know what we did a half hour there and a half hour home? Vanjie said, we talked. It's what you do on a road trip. And that's what Paul and Timothy would do as they journey from place to place. they talk about it. And, and Timothy would ask Paul questions, and Paul would share and he mentored Timothy along the way. Timothy witnessed the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to transform hearts, to work through darkness, to work through difficulty. Timothy saw it all. 
And Paul was saying, look, Timothy, here's the deal. You've seen all of this. Uh, and by the way, Timothy, you have a godly heritage because of your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. You've heard it from them. God has birthed it in you, and you've seen it in me. You know this to be true. Now, Timothy, I'm about to go. You stand firm. Now, the passage that Eleanor read for you many times you hear as a general superintendent is laying his hands on someone's head and ordaining them to the ministry. But it is not just for ministers, by the way, because we are all ministers. We are all ministers. We are all called to the ministry of the word. We are all cared, called to teach, to rebuke, to defend. That's all of us. So the next time you read uh, 2 Timothy 4, 2, remember, that's for you to preach the word as well. I think it was Francis of Assisi said, speak the word always and use words if you must. Paul mentored Timothy and recreated in Timothy's life that divine calling, that divine mission, and reproduced the power of the grace of Jesus Christ in Timothy's life. That is the mission of a mentor. What is a mentor after all? Someone who knows something. Someone who knows something who will come alongside someone else who doesn't know something and teach them what they know. That's all there is to it. I mean, we make it so complicated these days. But all it is is someone who knows something teaching someone else who doesn't know something. That's it. Now, bring that over into our life as followers of Jesus Christ. What is a spiritual mentor? Someone who knows something. They're reproducing that knowledge in the life of someone else. The mission of a mentor is to recreate the knowledge, the life, the grace, the power of God in the life of another. The mission of a mentor is to recreate the knowledge, the experience, the grace, the power of God that he has so freely given us in the life of another. To mentor someone is to enter into a relationship where that which we know can be reproduced in them. Why is that so important for us today? Somewhere out there, the, the idea has come around that this generation doesn't want to have anything to do with old folks. Can I just speak to you bluntly about that? That is a lie from the pit of hell. That is a lie from the pit of hell. If you believe it, you need to stop. Okay? And, and I'm going to just put him on record. Uh, John Ryan, do you hate the old folks in this congregation this morning? No? What would you like from them? Yeah. What would you like from them? Friendship. It has been my experience over the years, the young people are coming along, want one thing from the people who are beyond them, someone to care, someone to come alongside them, someone to affirm that they have value, that what they have to say is important, that they have gifts and talents, and to release them to carry on the mission of Christ in them. That's something we can all do. Somewhere we've set up this generational warfare. It's not scriptural, by the way. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We are called to invest in others. We are called to pour our lives in them. We are called to teach, and by the way, not expect them to do things the same way that we do them. Because God works in new and varied ways all the time, doesn't he? Okay. Well, I could go on there, but I won't. One of the first conversations I ever had with Bob goes back nine years. 
we had our morning Bible study, or prayer time there for a long time. And I remember to this day Bob sharing an article that he read with me from Guidepost magazine. He said, I, I found from this article that there are three people that everyone should have in their life. There should be a person who's come be ahead of them. We should have that person in our life who's walked the journey longer than we have. Why? Because we need those guides in our life. People who have been there, who can help us, who, who can testify into our life. Let me tell you what God did for me when I was there. Not to say you've got to do it this way, but this is who God was. The second person we should have in our life is someone who is at the same place in our life. Why? Because we need those persons who can understand specifically what it is we're struggling with. Who can encourage us, who can say, man, you can do this. And we should have someone who's coming along behind us. We should be pouring our lives into someone else so that they can follow me as I follow Christ. By the way, that's another quote from Paul. Not follow me as I do it this way because I'm smart and talented and handsome. No, follow me as I follow Christ because I've been there. This is who Christ has been to me and who he will be to you follow me as I follow Christ. So I have two questions that I want to ask you as we wrap this up this morning. The first is this question. Who is your mentor? Who is your mentor? We live in a culture that says you do it by yourself. My son's favorite quote is a toddler. Me do it myself. It does this pop pops heart great to know that there is a little two-year-old who has that very same mindset in my son's household. I laugh like crazy. It's funny in a toddler, but it's deadly in the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. It's deadly in the life of a follower of Jesus Christ not to have any. It is deadly in the life of a believer not to have someone who can be your guide along the way, who can help you in your journey. Who is it that Satan goes after? The ones who are by themselves. Who is your mentor? Who are you intentionally talking to about the work of Christ in you? But the second question to me is more important than the first. The second question is more significant to me than the first, and it is this. Who are you mentoring? We've been talking all this church here, and we'll continue to talk about sharing your faith out, outside the walls of this church. It's how the kingdom of God grows. Who are you mentoring? Who are you pouring yourself into who is it that you are intentionally engaging to pass on the work of Christ that he has so freely lavished upon you? They're all around you. There are younger men and women in your life every day that you may or may not see who desperately want someone to say, you have value. God loves you. God can do this in you who desperately need the gift of God reproduced in them. This morning, as we wrap this part of our service up, I'd like you to praise God for the spiritual fathers and mothers in your life. I'd like you to celebrate the work of God that he's accomplished in you. One thing I know about this church is we have those lions of our faith. Many of them rest right outside that wall. But many of them have poured their self into your life. We need to celebrate that work of God through them. But I also want to challenge you this morning. Because the question we must continually ask ourselves as a local body of Christ is, who will be those people today? Who will it be in 10 or 15 years that we will celebrate that person poured their life into me? I am here today because they cared enough to love me. They cared enough to allow God to express His grace through me. 
they had cared about me enough to pray for me and walk the walk of God today. Who will you mentor? I encourage you and challenge you like Paul to pour yourself into the life of someone else. Let me pray for you this morning. Father in heaven, I thank you this day for the grace of God through Jesus Christ. We are a people upon whom you have lavished grace upon grace upon grace. And Father, in this day, in this service, I thank you and praise you for my dad, for my grandfather, for Brother Livingston and Dr. Truesdale. I thank you for the prayers of a grandmother whom I never met praying for preachers to be born in her line. Father, we are the recipients of those who have come before us. Today, Father, I pray for each one in this congregation to have the grace, to have the courage, to have the love, to pour themselves into someone else's life, that the mission of the gospel may carry on and on,